the little book of 2 John. Just go to Revelation, take a left. Very, very small book. I'm going to look at a few verses out of there this morning. And out of respect, would you stand as we read the Word of God? We're going to read the first six verses. 2 John, the elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. You may be seated. Our Father and our God, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, grant us. And what we are not, make us. In the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Well, Mother's Day, a great day for some people. In our family, it's a wonderful day. I love my mother. I love my mother-in-law. They both passed away. My wife's the mother of two of our children. My daughter now has two of her own. So it's a really good day in our household. But for some of you, it may be a painful day. Maybe the childhood you didn't want. Maybe a mother that didn't live up to expectations. Things that are hard to get over in life. Mother's Day is one of those days for a preacher. It's like, who do you preach to? You preach to the mothers, and the guys are going to go to sleep. Not uncommon. You preach to the guys and the, the wives and the mothers, they're going to be, yeah, you're right. Preach it, brother. Tell them to pick up that underwear. Doing that one dish isn't housework. And, of course, the children, they're like, well, what do we do? It's, this isn't our sermon. I believe in ex preaching in an expository manner where you pick a passage of Scripture and you just work through it. And I wanted to pick a passage of Scripture that would speak to everybody on Mother's Day. It's a passage that, from 2 John, where John is writing to the church, and we are all part of that church. It's a small little book, 300 words or so, not well read, but very rich, very deep in doctrines of love and of truth. And just in the first six verses, the word love is used four times. The word truth, five times. Love and truth tied together. But more importantly, we see the source of love and the source of truth. And from these great doctrines of love and truth, we're given three commandments. In verse 4, to be walking in the truth. In verse 5, to be loving one another. And in verse 6, that we walk according to his commandments. And verses 1 through 3 are key to understanding the doctrine of love and truth, of walking in the truth, loving one another, walking according to the commandments of God. In verse 1, it starts out, the elder, the elder. At this point in his life, John is an older man. He's kind of looking toward the end of his life. There's lots gone on in his life. Still a lot more to happen. 
but a lot has gone on. Remember, this is the apostle that was closest to Christ, that leaned on his breast at the Passover meal. And his, epistle, his gospel is the gospel, I think, is the closest that shows us God in the flesh with us, the God-man, the divine nature. Not that the others don't, not that Matthew, Mark, and Luke skip over that, but I think if you had to pick one gospel, you only, only had one book of the Bible, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better than the book of John. So much there talks about Jesus the Savior, Jesus as God. He also wrote these epistles, 1 John, where he confronts heresy. And, but always the aim of his writing is to drive us to Christ, to point us to Christ. And he says that at the end of his gospel in John 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name, true life in his name. It's written by the elder. Then he addresses it to the elect lady. There's been some debate in, among scholars over the centuries. What does he mean by this? And some have thought it may have been an actual woman and her children. But reading other books of John, the other book of 1 John, reading the writings of Peter, reading the, right, the writings of Paul, it's, I think it's a metaphor where he's talking about the church and those in the church. So instead of a book that's a personal letter just to one person and her little kids, and we can just kind of discard it, no, this is a book that's written for me, for you, for every one of us, that we can learn from the apostle, the truths of Scripture. Then he says, whom I love in the truth. John is writing out of his great love for the church. His great love. He pours his life into the church. And then he says, but also all who know the, the truth. And all who are true believers should be in love with the church as John was. We should embrace the church, love the church, desire the church, want the best for the church, want to see the church grow. The church father, Cyprian, said, he who would not have the church as his mother will not have God as his father. We should be that enamored of the church and desiring her peace, her purity, her righteousness, zealous for the love of the brothers and the sisters in the truth. But what is truth? So Pilate asks, what is this thing called truth? What does he mean by that? Just some general proverb that sort of happens most of the time? Is he talking about a, a good feeling we have, getting together and singing songs and drinking little cups of grape juice and eating little bits of bread and seeing people get splashed or dunked, whatever your persuasion is? No, it's so much more than that. There is absolute truth. If I were to get up here and say to you, I'd like to talk to you about my experience, I think you should get up and walk out. <laughs> because I'm not here to talk about my experience. I'm here to talk to you about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Very God of very God. Begotten, not made being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost. And for us men suffered on the cross, paid the debt for our sin, died a horrible, horrible death, buried but rose again to prove the victory and show that God had accepted the sacrifice. 
And Jesus says this himself in John chapter 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the message of the cross. That's the message of the church. That must be the central message we always have. Christ, the way. Christ, the truth. Christ, the life. He is the only way to come back to God from the sin that has separated us. He is the only truth in life. He is the only life we can have. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And then he says in verse 2 of 2 John, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us some of the time. Will be with us when we obey and walk the straight and narrow and never stray off it. Will be with us when we feel like we're giving enough money, doing this, X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. No. Will be with us forever. What did we read in Ezekiel earlier? God will give us a new heart. God will give us a new spirit. God will give us true repentance and saving faith when he gives us his grace, as we see in Ephesians. For by grace are you saved by faith. This is not your own doing. This is the gift of God, so that no one may boast. And when he gives us these gifts of truth and of love, they will abide with us forever and never leave us. I love how John puts it in or Jesus puts it in John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. He doesn't say I give them probationary life. I give them conditional life. I give them life if they do this. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I just love how Psalm 136, and I, I've been reading this um, reading plan where you read a couple of Old Testament passages a day, a couple of new, and today it just happened to be coincidentally, not that we believe in coincidence, Psalm 136. That's that long psalm that seems kind of boring because there's a phrase that will say something God has done, and then 26 times there'll be a refrain that says, for his steadfast love endures forever. Over and over the psalmist is saying, Here's what God has done to you, nation of Israel, for his steadfast love endures forever. We defeated this people for his steadfast love endures forever. I brought you out of slavery for his steadfast love endures forever. I fed you in the wilderness for his steadfast love endures forever. And that's not only for this life. As Paul writes in Thessalonians, so shall we ever be with the Lord so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then in verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and in life. As we learned in verse 2, and we also saw in John 14, that the source of that truth, the source of that love, is the Father. When Christ went to the cross, it wasn't kicking and screaming. The Father didn't, or when Christ didn't go to the cross making a deal with the Father, saying, if I do this, I know you want to kill these people because they've disobeyed you. Will you let them go? 
No, eternally before the world began, there was a covenant where they agreed to redeem his people. The love of the Father, the love of the Son, the love of the Holy Spirit working together. Remember what it said in John 14, no one comes to the Father but through me. But I love in this verse, he's not just talking about this love and truth. God's grace, God's mercy, God's peace will all abide with us. We need to think about these things, not just his truth and love, but look at all these gifts God has given to you. God has given to those who that put their faith in Christ, who God has called, God has redeemed, God has given grace, and now they've given that faith that God has given them back to him and trusted in him. And what does God do? He gives you truth. He gives you his love. He gives you his grace, his reconciling grace, bringing him back to himself without any obligation on our parts. I love how in Romans it says in Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from him, by him, from the wrath of God? He gives us his mercy. His mercy. What do you think about that? When you came to Christ, were you co equal with Christ? No. It goes on in Romans to say, we were his enemy. We were at war with Christ. Enemies are not friends. Enemies are not going out chumming together, chilling out together, hanging out. We were at war. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. God's grace. Grace to a sinner. God was never obligated to save even one. But his grace, his mercy, and his peace are all ours. And in verse 1 of Romans 5, we read, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's grace, God's mercy, God's peace, God's truth, God's love, all a part of you at conversion, all a part of you when God gives you that new heart. And then he turns to us and says, in verse 4, we are commanded to be walking in the tru- truth, I rejoice greatly to find some of you, some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. Walking in the truth. You ever try to walk on two roads at one time? I mean, Robert Frost, who was not a believer, wrote a fantastic poem, Two Roads to Virgin and Yellow Wood. I couldn't walk down both of them. I had to pick one. That's the way it's going to be in your Christian life. How do we live our lives? How much are we walking on God's path? 168 hours in one week. We spend one of them right here. Maybe an hour and a half if the preacher's really long-winded. And you're probably hoping not this morning. What do you do with the other 167? Are you walking in truth at work, doing the right thing? That's going to be harder and harder and harder as the times go on. Or are you willing to compromise, give up, give in? Are you walking in the truth with your friends, modeling Christ, bearing the love of Christ to them, or just letting them kind of slide away, get away with their sin. And I've I've been there. I've had friends like that that are 
You know, they're living in sin. You just kind of, you don't say much. You just kind of, not that you're embarrassed. You just, you just don't know what to say. Are we walking in truth with our families? Ouch. Ooh, he's going to get personal here. You men, you fathers, are you modeling Christ for your wives, for your children? Praying with them, teaching them, leading them. Mothers, catechizing your children, showing the virtue and love to your children. It can be hard. I mean, my, my daughter, I remember those days now watching her with two kids under the age of three. I mean, there's diapers and toys and stuff everywhere. I mean, they come to our house, it's like a toy tornado went through the living room. And there's just stuff everywhere. And they don't even live with us. I mean, it's hard. Hard to show that forbearance. My mom, uh, my wife said this morning, we were talking about Mother's Day. And like, what was it like for your mom? You had five kids in the house. Well, she just went to the bathroom and closed the door and locked it. Well, what would you do? We'd all stand outside the door and try to talk to her. <laughs> it's really hard to model Christ back and walk that path. And children, obeying your parents. I'm sure your parents drive you crazy at times. My parents drove me crazy until I started paying taxes and had to make a mortgage payment. You realize maybe old dad wasn't as stupid after all. And my parents were not the most virtuous, but they were godly. In the ancient world, actually up until about 150 years ago, we were walking everywhere. You wanted to go somewhere, you walked. You needed to go to the store, you walked. You need to go to work, you walked. You want to go to church, you walked. You might, if you were wealthy, have a horse or a buggy. Or if you wanted to go on a long trip, you might could take a, a, um, a carriage, hire a carriage. Or you maybe could, if you lived near a seaport, could take a boat. But for the most part, you were walking, walking, walking. It's a common metaphor used in Scripture. Paul uses it five times just in Ephesians 4 and 5. It's a common thread. The Christian life is a long walk of obedience in the same direction. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Sometimes we get out of the gate as a believer and we're just like, take off. And then we, what do we do? We stop reading our Bibles. We stop going to church. We stop praying, and you run out of gas really, really quick. How do we do this, though? Well, I gave you a hint just now, reading your Bible, praying in, in church with the sacraments. But how do we do it? Do we just kind of tough it out? I mean, we're New Englanders. We just kind of do it. I mean, my wife is just incredibly good at this. I mean, she is, I'm, I'm from the South, and we are, we're really soft. Um, I get sick, and it's like, I'm the worst patient in the world. My daughter this week sprained her leg and broke a bone in her foot, and she's Southern. I mean, she's just like, I'm dying. I'm, I'm dying here. <laughs> My wife is like, you know, maybe half a Tylenol, you know, tomorrow, but, you know, tough, tough woman. We just grit it out? No. When we walk, whose footsteps do we want to walk in? We want to walk in the footsteps of the Master, the footsteps of Jesus. There's no other place we can look. Thinking about where he walked. Where did he walk to? Walk to the cross. He didn't take an Uber. They strapped a piece of wood on his back. Like a four by four or six by six rough hewn. Tied it to him. Naked. After being beaten. And he walked to his place of execution. And the writer of Hebrews tells us, Therefore, 
since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And then the next line just slays me. Who for the joy set before him. The joy. The joy of what? The cross. The joy of being tortured and humiliated and degraded and suffering a horrible death. He counted it joy for you and you and you. Those that the Father gave him were a joy. He would suffer that way for you. We not only be walking in the truth, but in verse 5 it tells us we are to be loving one another. And now I ask you, dear lady, I now ask you, dear church, not as though I are writing a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. That we love one another. You know, we can have some capacity to love in our natural state. We can have what the Bible calls eros, a physical love, erotic love, although that word has been corrupted in the current culture. We can have philios, a brotherly love, where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But we can never love as God loves, as God demands, unless he first loves us. It's a love that's so unique. The Bible actually coined a new word for it. Not eros, not philios, but I'm sure you've heard the word agapeo. A sacrificial love, not a self-seeking love, a love that only God has, but it's a love that he grants to his children and to share with others. Galatians 5.22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is, first of all, love. When you come to Christ, when he redeems you, when he gives you that saving faith, that true repentance, that reconciliation, he puts into you his love. That same agapeo, that same love that he has. Why does he do that? Why? Well, first of all, it glorifies him. In John 15, we read, By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. He also does it so that we bear witness for Christ. Puts that love in us that, where we can go to our neighbors and bear witness, go to our coworkers, go to our families. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for another. Brothers and sisters, when we love others, it's showing to the world a supernatural love that can't come from within us, and they know that in their hearts. It's only a love that God can impart upon us and it bears witness of the love of Christ for his glory. You're commanded to walk in truth in verse 4, commanded to be loving one another in verse 5. And in verse 6, we are commanded to walk according to his commandments. The Christian life is not one of inaction, doing your own thing. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card, not checking off your bucket list, I went to Charles Stanley's church when I lived in Atlanta in the early 80s, and I used to love how he'd say this, that when we accept Christ, most people just want a life of ease, comfort, and pleasure. 
that will be the life for some people. God will incredibly bless some people with wealth and good things, but that's not a promise. That's just a blessing that God gives to a few. What does Jesus say, though? John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. The moral law of God. He's not talking about the ceremonial law. He's not talking about the civil, the um, sacrificial law where we cut open bulls and make sacrifices. He's talking about the moral law. But he's not talking about the moral law that we obey it to obtain life. We don't obey the law so that we can please God, earn our way back into heaven, or keep our status as redeemed people. We obey the moral law. We obey Christ out of love for Christ to bear witness for Christ, to glorify Christ. We have to make three mistakes in regards to this commandment. First is legalism, where we make obedience something we think we must do to win God's favor. And the other is the opposite end of that. It's a, I'll give you the Greek word, I mean the 50 cent word is called antinomianism. It means against the law, where we teach that we don't have to obey the law. We live under grace. I'm not bound by that. I don't have to do that. And the third is just an inaction, ignoring the command. And sometimes that, at best, it's maybe that inaction is done because of a misunderstanding. And sometimes at its worst, it's just downright willful disobedience. It's that legalism, which often leads to antinomianism. You just like, after a while, you just, I can't do this anymore. You just give up trying to obey the law. And it's like, just, I'm done. And then there's no commands that you obey at all. And when that happens, or if that happens, we must ask God to grant us true repentance so that we can live out the truths of Scripture in the power of Christ. Paul gives us a, a beautiful passage in um, Philippians. In chapter 2, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always believed, obeyed, excuse me, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only my presence, not only while I'm here as your pastor in your church, you know, I know you're doing the right thing, but in my absence, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. And you're like, well, that doesn't help. Work out my salvation? It's like, what do you mean? It's like, that's like, that's, that's not very encouraging. That's not very pastoral. Work it out. It's like, no, that's not what he means. He doesn't mean you have to like work it out to regain your salvation or maintain or keep. The next verse is the key to the whole thing. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do. I love to see your mouths moving when I say that verse. No, I'm serious. That, that shows you've been well taught. For it is God who works in you. God is the one that's going to be working in you when you allow him to get out of the way. He works in you to will. He changes your disposition, changes your heart. He doesn't violate your personality. He doesn't violate your, your inner person. But he changes your desires and your wants and your heart to want to please him, to want to follow him. And then he gives you the ability to work it out. It's so important that we learn that. that we know that God gives us the desire and that God helps you to do it. I love how the uh, book of Ephesians is structured. Um, if you have done any, any minor, or, you know, any type of, Bible study on the book of Ephesians, you'll see that the first three chapters are what we call um, doctrinal. There's a lot of teaching. He doesn't give a lot of imperatives or commands, but he talks about what our status is as a believer. And he uses a two-word phrase that's key. If you were to go up to somebody in Palestine in like AD 50 and say, are you a Christian? They would say, say what? 
They're like, what, what do you mean? That, that was a pejorative Christian. You know, little Christ, they were making fun of people. That wasn't the vernacular of the day. But what they would say is they'd come up and say, are you in Christ? Is your life in Christ? Do you live your life in Christ? And in the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul uses that term, in Christ, or in Christ Jesus, or in Jesus, 34 times, driving into the people, driving home, teaching them that your life is always to be lived in Christ, not in your own power, not in your own strength. And then in the second, or the next three chapters, chapters four through six, he starts to give commands, walk in love, walk according to the Spirit, don't walk foolishly, husbands love your wives, children obey your parents, you know, slaves obey your masters. But notice he doesn't give all the imperatives first, all the commands first, and then give us a little doctrine at the end. Because then what happens? You become legalistic. You have to, I've got to do this. I've got to, I've got to obey this. I've got to do this. Is obedience important? Yes. Or commands important? Yes. But we must understand first who we are in Christ. Who we are in Christ. Walking in the truth, loving one another, walking according to his commandments. Walking, loving, obeying. Is God speaking to you about this today? Are you laying something on your heart? And I'm not going to give an altar call. We don't, I'm Presbyterian. We don't usually do that. We're the frozen chosen, remember? That's, a, that's not a good pejorative. Well, we truly think that God works in the heart, and we don't want to put the pressure on you. Let the Holy Spirit do that. But if God is drawing you to himself, have you called out to him in faith in response? For some of you, this may be a first step that you've never even considered the cross of Christ before, never even considered there's such a thing as absolute truth, never even considered there's such a thing as an absolute, eternal perfect God, and that we are out of sync with him because of our sin. Not only out of sync, but eternally condemned. But God is extending his grace to us today, extending his love, extending his mercy. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. I am an ambassador for Christ. And those of you who bear the name of Christ, you are to be ambassadors for Christ as well. God making his appeal through us. We implore you, I implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he, that is God the Father, made him, that is Jesus, to be sin, the one who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together then with him, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Do not receive the grace that is offered now in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listen to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. For those of you who are still somewhat struggling with that Christian life, that thing about walking in faith, walking in obedience, living your life in Christ, what does the Master say to you? Come to me, all who labor. Heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And then he says a phrase that is just radical. And I mean radical, goes to the root of the issue. He's going to tell you what his heart is like. And this is the God of the universe speaking. The God who made you speaking. He's about to reveal his heart to you. And what does he say? He doesn't say I'm harsh and vindictive. 
and I hate you because of your sin, and you're going to hell. He doesn't say, I'm passive and indifferent. You just, you figure it out. I did my part on the cross. You go work it out on your own. That's your thing. I did mine. No. I am gentle and lowly. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. What does that imply? You ever been to the Rochester Fair or one of the big fairs around here and you see the ox pulling? Took our little kids there, used to love to go to watch the ox pulling. These two humongous ox, they probably weigh like 2,000 pounds a piece. And they have this thing called an ox yoke between them. It's a large bar about maybe four inches by 12 inches, somewhat curved, and they tie or tether the two ox to the yoke. And what do they tie them there for? They're not just show oxen, they're actually working oxen. They have a purpose. Christ is saying, when you come to me, you are now tethered to me. You're not tethered to Christ to just sit back for a life of ease, comfort, and pleasure. Jesus isn't going to say, let's go do your own thing, and I'll just kind of go along for the ride. No, you're there to obey. You're there to follow Christ, to be with Christ. But when you're tethered to the ox, who's doing the pulling here? Who's the stronger of the two? It's Christ. And when you're tethered to Jesus in the ox yoke, you tether two oxen together, what do they see? You see a whole lot of the other ox. You allow yourself to be tethered to Christ, you're going to see a lot of Jesus. That's what you want to see. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I am gentle and only heart. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. Always with the master in the yoke. Never taking ourselves out. Always with Christ beside us. For his love endures forever. For his love endures forever. For his steadfast love endures forever. Our Father and our God, as we think about these things, bind them to our hearts as you have bound yourself to us in love. Never to separate from us never to walk away, never to say, no, I changed my mind. This is an eternal covenant that you have made since before time began. We praise you, O God. We bless you, O God. We give you all glory. And for those here who have never tasted of the goodness of Christ, never bound themselves to the yoke of Christ, May this be the moment, O oh God, where you work in their heart a new heart. Remove that heart of stone and place a heart of flesh. Grant them a new pure spirit, your Holy Spirit within them. Grant them true repentance and saving faith where they call upon you. And for those of us who have joined together with Christ, may we continue to walk with him, beside him, with him leading the way both now and forever. In your name we pray. Amen.